looking at the Molyneux collection, they give us a perfect glance into Victorian London and the way Londoners at the time presented themselves. We've invited Dr. Serena Dyer, fashion historian, to Tower Bridge today to tell us more about how Victorian Londoners at the time presented themselves. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? I'm an associate professor of fashion history at De Montfort University in Leicester, and I spend my time researching the history of clothing, how it was made, how people shopped for it, and what it can tell us about people's lives and interests throughout history. So talking about Victorian fashion, the first question which springs to mind is, is who set the trends in fashion? So fashion is really speeding up in the 19th century. The fashion magazine has become incredibly important and incredibly popular. And it's also becoming a lot more democratised. A lot more people have access to those fast-changing trends. So when Victorians went to buy fashion, where did they go? Did they go... Obviously, they didn't go online. No. Where the catalogues? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so... At the beginning of the 19th century, there's barely any ready-made fashion market. Almost every garment, whoever you were, was going to be made specifically for you, or you'd be buying something second-hand and having it adapted to your body. By the end of the 19th century, the ready-made market has really taken off, both for the elites and for working people. For the elites, you might be going to the department stores, but your working Victorian person is more likely to still be getting some ready-made garments, but still to be getting a lot of things second-hand, remade, repurposed for them. But the important thing is that they're holding on to these things. There isn't the same kind of fast fashion cycle um, as we're used to today. So even though fashion has sped up, there's still a far more close appreciation for garments, a care for them. The way you dressed and presented yourself could have some quite practical impact. Absolutely. So Victorian Londoners did not have credit cards and very rarely did they carry ready cash on them for fear that it would get stolen. But there is a credit system in place and it's almost entirely based on how you're dressed and how you're presenting yourself. Does the shopkeeper trust that you are who you say you are and that you will have the money to pay your bill when they send it to you at the end of the day? So the way that you're dressed and your face literally is how you gain credit. Say for the 30th of June, 1894, you're invited for the royal uh, opening of Tower Bridge. What would you wear? Well. However, well, whatever your place was within the social class system of the 19th century, you're going to have your everyday clothing, but you're also still going to have your Sunday best. So for men, that's going to be a variation of the three-piece suit. Um, it's going to be made out of wools and natural fibres, which are actually incredibly breathable and comfortable, even on a June afternoon. For women, you're going to be wearing a sort of a simplified version of the fashions of the time. So for elite women in the middle of the 1890s, they had massive sleeves, they had beautifully bell-shaped skirts. That would get a little bit crumpled on the crowds on Tower Bridge. So you're going to wear a simplified version of that. There's lots of variations to women's garments that we don't necessarily see so much in men's garments. There's lots more choice there. It's very interesting that you mentioned the, the breathable nature of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the fashion at the time, because looking at these photographs, they look incredibly heavy and stiff and, and, and warm. I think it's really misleading when we look at these photographs, because if we went out and bought a three-piece suit today, even if you're getting something that's a nice summer lightweight wool, it's going to be lined with polyester, or if you're lucky, lined with silk. And they are warm fabrics, incredibly warm fabrics. These suits are more likely to have been lined with a cotton or a linen, so you're retaining that breathability, and they're incredibly responsive to the changing weather. So what was fashionable in the late 1800s? What would surprise us as a modern person? The big trend for women, though, in this period is big sleeves. Um, 
perhaps not the most practical of things if you're trying to make your way across Tower Bridge, um, but they really sort of set out the 1890s. They are the fashion icon of the 1890s for women. What about colours? Colours are far more vibrant than we might think that they are. When we look back at sepia and black and white photographs, it seems that everything is sort of quite sombre. But actually, by the end of the 19th century, we've invented aniline dyes, which give us fantastic, vibrant colours. So I think that these photographs give us a fantastic insight into the people, but we're missing that layer of colour until we look to do something like recolorize them and really bring back the vibrancy that was the Victorian streets. So looking at these photographs, what do the clothes people are wearing tell us about their social status? Victorian society is incredibly reliant upon this structure of the class system, and that really comes through in people's clothing. So the bowler hat is incredibly fascinating because this was essentially the hard hat of the Victorian period. So this was invented um, in response to the need to protect the heads of people who were out on the hunt doing the beating. And there was a 19th century aristocrat who commissioned um, a London hat maker to come up with a hat that would protect the heads of his beaters. And the hat maker went about his work, came up with this invention. The aristocrat went to see what had been uh, invented. And to test it out, he threw it on the floor and he stamped his foot on it and it was unharmed, it was undamaged. So that was good enough to protect the heads of his beaters. And from that moment, it became the uniform of the working Victorian man. So it might not be bright yellow, it might not have high visibility tape on it, but it was the hard hat of the Victorian worker. And of course, the bowler hat, as we know it today, we might associate it with the character of Mr. Banks and Mary Poppins, with bankers and people working in the city. But that's the transition that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it's a really fascinating example of a fashion going from the working people up the social ranks to the middle classes rather than the reverse. Would the workers then have made a special effort when they knew that the lead architect or the uh, resident engineer was present? Absolutely. So this would be a real mark of respect that you're going to wear your best clothing, still appropriate for the task that you're doing, but you're going to be fully dressed, you're going to wear your jacket, you're going to wear your waistcoat, even though you're doing that manual labour, because you know that you're around people of that higher social class. So it really is kind of, again, reinforcing that stratification and your awareness of it. It's very interesting if we look at this here, because here we see Crutwell and possibly John Wolfe Barry in the, in the centre and then surrounded by workers here mm -hmm. who are clearly, as you mentioned, wearing, yeah, waistcoat and, and, uh, and, and, and suits and so on. And that three-piece suit is also working as a kind of work wear, though. It's protecting your body against falling bits of debris. And it might look very alien to us and our modern sort of awareness of what protective wear might look like, but it's fulfilling that same function. So beyond the hats, how would you read a person in terms of their clothes? Well, one of the key ways that to a 19th century eye would have been very obvious, but is maybe a little bit more obscure to our modern eyes, is the quality of the fabrics. So 19th century people would have been far more aware of what a good quality wool looks like versus a poorer quality wool. Most modern people would just sort of think, oh, it's wool. So there's a far greater material literacy, a far greater awareness of what fabrics are, how much they might cost, what they would feel like, etc., and how long they're going to last. Because this clothing is meant to be mended and meant to be looked after and cared for. So it's not necessarily the case that working class people are wearing poor quality wools. They might just be more durable wools that might be cheaply or more cheaply produced than the very, very fine wools that a middle class person or an upper class person might be able to wear. So they're minute differences, not necessarily in style, just in the quality of the materials and the appropriateness of the materials for the kinds of work that you're going to do. So let's have a look at some of the photographs. Mm. 
Uh, I find this one very interesting, which shows our Edward Crutwell, mm -hmm. engineer, in conversation with a gentleman in a top hat mm -hmm. who we think is John Wolf Barry. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what can you tell us? What do you read with mm -hmm. your fashion expert eye out of this? Well, as we said, they are both wearing three-piece suits, absolutely. But the details of those three-piece suits are ever so subtly different. So the jacket of our more elite gentleman is longer. If you were doing work on a bridge, you wouldn't want a long length jacket, it would get in the way. So that's, again, the symbol of not having to do that kind of physical labor. I like the top hat, you know, he's not needing that head protection. He's able to wear his slightly more fancy headwear. And we're also seeing some lighter colors in those trousers. So again, you're probably going to want to wear wool colors that are not going to show the dust and the dirt quite so much if you're working. Another photograph, and uh, I mentioned it before, it's, it's one of the new discoveries of the public opening on 9th of July, when all of London basically turned up on Tower Bridge. Have a look at this one. So uh, what does it tell you? Well, again, we've got a lot of bowler hats, so it's clear that this isn't just a practical hat for use on site, but it is uh, a class signifier. It is the smart headwear that working men are wearing. And it does seem to be predominantly working class men that have shown up for this event. So this is the public en masse. This is not an elite event. This isn't something that just the middling sorts are coming to. This is the people of London. And yes, they might look smartly dressed to us. We've got lots of shirts and ties and collars, but this is working people. And we can also spot some potential women in the crowd. So I think that there is one lady just here that has a boater hat on with a lovely ribbon on it. And then there's another lady who isn't wearing a hat, which is actually quite shocking to be a Victorian lady and not be wearing a hat when you're outside. So we are seeing some women showing interest in this event as well and coming along. And with the boater probably putting on their similar best hat for a working lady. I find it quite interesting because it was a Monday mm -hmm. when Tower Bridge opened mm -hmm. and there's still so many people apparently taking time off to visit the bridge. Absolutely. I mean, maybe it was just that important of an event that employers were willing to let their workers go out and experience it for the day in the same way as you would with a coronation um, or a major royal event. So this clearly was incredibly significant in London. Well, thank you, Serena, for being with us today. And thank you for looking into these pictures. It has been a fascinating glance into Victorian society through the clothes that we're oh, it's wearing. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.